Okay, well, before we get to the student presentations, I wanted to show you something that happened again. And Ethan, you're going to have to remind me. <clears throat> Just Sunday, or I think it was probably Saturday, up in, is it Niles? Is that how you pronounce that name? Michigan? That's just north of Grand Forks, or uh, not Grand Forks, but uh, Fort Wayne, right? Anybody know that, that town? I see it on the, inter on the interstate, Niles. Anyway, a uh, 13-year-old died of uh, carbon monoxide poisoning at a swimming pool. Wasn't that the article that you kind of summarized where the two people died, and then the kid died later, and it was found to be a swimming pool in a hotel? I saw that and I'm going, wow, because I think they did this at a hotel. They were um, having some kind of swim party or whatever. So then what that prompted me, last night I said to myself, okay, I'm going to, you know, I showed you the, um, the plug-in carbon monoxide detector, right, that you can have in your home if you go to a hotel. I was at a hotel this weekend at the Hoosier Horse Fair and the Idle Jorg thing. Did you think I had my carbon monoxide detector with me? Yes. But then there's one that you can wear on your pocket. Like if you're a utility person or you're really freaky, I'm not that freaky, but I'm, I ordered one, so hopefully next week I'll show it to you. But then I ran into a radon detector that you sit on your dresser, and it has Pico Curie's readout. I didn't realize those existed. Remember how you usually put something out and then you mail it away and somebody reads it? So I ordered one of those too so I could show you the picogram radon detector. It's just north of South Bend. North, north of South Bend. Bend. Okay, north yeah. of South Bend. Okay. I knew it was up there someplace. I see the sign for it on the interstate. But anyway, it's a tragic thing. And I, I didn't read the whole thing, but it seemed like they were at a pool party. And then, you know how kids are, they're breathing a lot. If you breathe a lot and you're in a carbon monoxide detect, uh, environment, you're gonna be affected more than somebody sitting on the sideline watching, right? Because every time you breathe in, the CO goes to your hemoglobin and grabs onto it and doesn't come out. And so somebody that's like swimming and running around a lot and panting, in a sense, they would be affected more by it than like an adult sitting watching. Yeah? I read that when they went in there, like the first person that went in there, the reading they got was like 855 parts uh, per million. Yeah. I mean, Anything above 100 is like danger, so yeah. Yeah, remember those are detected as parts per million, so yeah. I just saw that and it was like deja vu, unfortunately. And uh, so, anyway, so let's have the first person come up here, person number one, and person number two stand by the door. Now, because I'm recording, I won't say names. Who's number two, do you know who you are? Okay, because remember, we're gonna go through this, come over here before I, and I just got like one minute of introduction. So we're gonna go through this and then we're gonna do this Wednesday. So today starts thermal regulation and it's probably the most practical stuff. I'm not sure why I leave it till the end, but uh, you know, cause we did gases, that's pretty practical and all that stuff, but uh, it's probably the one you can apply most to. Like if you own a dog, a cat, uh, an iguana, yourself, or if you have 500 cattle out on a range or a thousand cattle or whatever the number is, it could be 50,000. So it's very practical stuff. And uh, the first, uh, let's see, I think the first four people have like definitions of words they're gonna tell us about. And then, starting with the fifth person, their assignment was this, so listen up. Tell me some personal experience you've had with like trying to stay warm or trying to stay cool or some uh, animal experience that you've seen that you're trying to keep the animal warm or cool. So it's kind of practical things. And then Wednesday we'll start with uh, actually how heat transfers. So somebody's going to get an assignment, one of you that are doing Wednesday, you're like, for example, conduction, thermal conduction, thermal radiation, thermal convection, things like that. So let me get my uh, and practice on the wall there. It's that green vertical arrow, and I won't be skunked by the laser pointer again because I have spare batteries, and I think we're ready to go. Okay, okay so I'm just going to introduce homeostasis. The definition is the property of a system within the body of a living organism in which a variable is actively regulated to remain very near constant. 
So examples of that would be um, regulating body temperature, pH of extracellular fluids, um, glucose in the plasma, and then just general um, fluid volume in the body. So no matter what's going on um, around, like in the animal's environment, what it's eating, like if it's resting versus exercising, uh, homeostasis will always occur. And then each variable is controlled by a separate homeostat or regulator. So all those put together help to maintain life. And then further within that, there are positive and negative feedbacks. So an example would be if for body temperature, a normal human is at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So when your body starts to overheat, it sweats, which then cools the body by making more moisture on the skin for evaporation. And then on the flip side of that, when it's cold, the body sweats less and reduces the blood circulation to the skin. So that would be an example of negative feedback. Um, positive feedback is a change from the normal condition that increases the departure even more. So if a person gets a fever that's extremely high, like about 107 or higher, then the negative feedback system stops operating completely. She made a good point. The negative feedback system versus positive, in biological systems, it's much more common to have negative feedback systems, because just like she said, it tends to help stabilize. There's very few things that have a positive feedback system, and I'll tell you one that's very common, and it really only happens in the female of our species, and that's where increasing estrogen causes the LH surge, okay? That's a positive feedback system. But usually when you have hormones increasing, it actually decreases other hormones that are causing the increase, so it's a, that's a balancing thing. Thank you, excellent. Okay, number three, go by the door. That way we don't um, waste time with our material. So then, go to the next one. Yeah, practice on the, uh, there you go. Okay, so let me enlarge that just a little bit. And if you send me PDF files, it's actually easier to enlarge them and move them and stuff like this. Here we go. Okay, so we talked about homeostasis just before, and one of the examples is how you have your body um, regulates temperature. So we're going to talk about different classifications of how um, animals regulate their temperature. One of them is homeotherm, which is what we are. Um, no matter what their environment is, we're able to maintain homeostasis by our me metabolic um, rate. Um, Pocoliotherm, or like what we consider cold-blooded, where their environment greatly affects and they have to adjust their behavior in order to regulate the temperature and then heterotherm is kind of like the in-between where the animals can pick and choose um, what they want to do so for an example of that it's like a hummingbird during like the winter where it doesn't really have food supplies it'll slow down its metabolic rate and actually use the environment to help maintain its temperature and stuff like that a lot of invertebrates and insects do this as well so it's just kind of a way it's like a in between in a way for an animal to save metabolic energy by doing that and that's called torpor which is t-o-r-p-o-r um which is when the animal becomes like metabolically inactive or less active in order to like save energy so that was the hummingbird is is an example torpor yes torpor t-o-r-p-o-r yeah. okay. okay actually that's a see this is what's fun about it you know she found that beautiful diagram and you know, uh, you can see how endotherms, all our basically animals are endotherms, all our mammals. It's just, and she made the point that your homeotherm, no matter what your ambient temperature is, you have the same constant internal temperature up to a range, right? I mean, people die of hypothermia because they're out of their control, but it's, uh, that's a very good example. Thank you so much. Person number four, go over by the door. That's yours, right? Yes. Okay, let me enlarge it a little bit. Practice with that. The vertical green. Don't point it at anybody's face. Okay. Here we go. All right, so I am going to compare ectotherms and endotherms. So I just threw the definition up there, but I'm just focusing on the top two. Um, so endotherms, they create most of their heat through metabolic processes. Um, they are typically referred to as your warm-blooded animals. 
Um, they require more energy to heat their bodies than ectotherms. Um, so therefore they require a lot more food to meet those energy requirements. Um, ways that they tend to cool themselves, they use evaporation. So sweating or, I mean like dogs, they pant. So that kind of releases that heat to help cool down their body. Um, and then a cold weather strategy that I found that was kind of interesting is they actually decrease their metabolic rate um, and that kind of saves some energy for just a short period of, of time so that they can um, save up that energy. Um, ectotherms, they use external sources of heat um, or cool to regulate their body temperature. They are referred to as cold-blooded animals. Um, even though their body temperature stins, tends to stay in the same ranges as warm-blooded animals, um, they don't require um, as much energy to heat themselves, so they focus that energy on reproduction. Um, ways that they cool themselves, evaporation, so sweat, um, convection, they increase their blood flow to the surface of their body, and that kind of gets rid of their internal body heat. Um, conduction, um, they come in contact with a cooler surface, so, I mean, if there's cooler surface around, they'll tend to go to that if they're feeling overheated. And then ways that they um, heat themselves, convection, so they climb to a higher, higher ground, so up a tree or something like that. Um, conduction, they go to a warmer surface. Um, radiation, they lie in the sun and get the heat from the sun rays. And then insulation, they can change their body shape to kind of alter their surface area to gain more of that heat. And all those terms she was saying, it's going to be basically assigned on um, Wednesday. Conduction, convection, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Very good. Okay, we're ready for the next person, I think. And I'll change the slide here. I'm going to change my file here okay and let me make sure I've got you, know, you confirm that this is yours right yes, yes. practice with that it's the green <coughs> vertical area <clears throat> we are ready so I have thermodynamics and it's a branch of physics that studies the effects of temperature on physical systems and describes a process and okay and remember I'm partners so I want to I want to interject something here. <clears throat> you know, like in the physics department, I bet you there is a course called the Principles of Thermodynamics. <clears throat> and it's a branch of physics. And what's kind of interesting is our animals, no matter what animal you talk about, have to obey the same rules of thermodynamics that they teach over in physics. But the thing is, our animals are actually more complicated because when they, like the engineers, design something with heat flow or whatever, they don't have to worry about pipe sizes changing or surface area changing, because you know, like this building, everything's fixed. But an animal can dilate its blood vessels. It can move to a cooler surface. But all the principles are the same. The, the physical properties of how heat flows is the same for like a computer versus our animals, but it's a little more complicated when we talk about our animals. Um, it studies the relationship between like heat and work and other forms of energy and how they relate. And um, there's the zero, zeroth laws, and it's if two systems are each in thermal equilibrium with a third system, then those must be in equilibrium with each other. So like a, if A and B are equal, and then B and C are equal, then A and C must be equal. <laughs> and that will be on the test, that's for sure. And then there's the first law, and it's kind of a consequence of conservation of energy. And uh, energy can be converted from like one form to another, like it can't be created or destroyed. And then the second law, all works of process lead towards greater entropy. Um, it's like over time, things are gonna keep increasing in entropy. And in a isolated system, it can never decrease. And then the third law, as temperature goes down towards zero, entropy of the system approaches the same constant. So basically like entropy of a pure substance at absolute zero is zero. Yeah, absolute zero is a very interesting concept, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, thermodynamics, how heat flows is a big thing right there. Heat can flow, but it has to obey certain laws when it flows and we'll talk about it because like if you want to cool off a dog, there's ways to 
increase how heat is flowing out of the dog or how heat can flow into the dog depending on circumstances. Okay, uh, our next person, let's see, five, yes. Emma. And then number six, would you go by the door? This is the right one, Emma, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so mine was just telling experience with like how to keep an animal warm or like myself, but I chose my cat. Um, her name is Peanut. We fostered her, and when we fostered, when we got her, she was like this big. She was extremely tiny. And one of the things that they said that we needed to do was keep her warm at all times because she couldn't really do it herself. Um, I don't know if she was like a runt or what, but um, so we had to keep like a heater on her at all times where we were holding her. We, if she wasn't by the heater, just so like she can get like our warmth and everything like that. And whenever I would take her out, I'd wrap her in a blanket just so that, like she's because we had her in the winter time, so it was just easier to keep her warm with wrapping her in a blanket and she'd always fall asleep like that on car rides so okay so like we Emma started the your personal experience and that would be called insulation <laughs> right you're putting something around the animal and <clears throat> we'll talk about surface area has an effect on heat flow and insulation there are good insulators and there are bad insulators and so I'm interjecting something here uh, if you don't conduct heat very well, you're a good insulator, like a blanket's a good insulator. But some, some material conducts heat very well, and that's a very poor insulator, okay? So like if you had, for some reason, you wanted to wrap the animal in some metal, that would be very bad because it would take heat away from the animal. So there's conductors and there's insulators, and we'll, that's Wednesday coming up. Thank you. Okay. Person number seven, go by the door. This is yours, right, buddy? Yep. Okay, I might not be able to change the size. That's perfect right there. Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk about kind of the opposite. It's more on when your dog gets overheated and ways you can kind of cool it down if you notice. Um, so normally, like, excessive panning and stuff like that. There's a couple of pointers I do want to call out on this uh, steps you can take. Of course... I don't know how many people would normally take the temperature of your own dog, but you can do that to make sure that your dog's overheated, which your normal range is like 100 to 102. So if you're like 105 and up, you definitely want to start taking some steps to cool your dog down, or animal in that case too. Um, on here they suggest putting the cool and wet towels on the neck, armpit, between the legs, and then wet ear flaps or and paw pads. Another option you can do on the paw pads area is you can put like rubbing alcohol, which will definitely decrease your heat of your animal quickly. Um, and then another one on the fourth, it says give them the cool drinking water, which if you're excessive heat, you don't want to like let them drink a whole bunch of water at once, otherwise they're just going to throw it up and you pretty much worse in your scenario too. So, and then of course always take them to the vet office. Um, that pretty much covers everything I was wanting mm -hmm. to hit. Okay. Now, uh, you know, the rectal thermometer, uh, if anybody does dog breeding, they always have a rectal thermometer around because what, what's, what about body temperature and when whelping occurs? You can get a drop in body temperature like right like an hour or so before they Yeah, start. and the, when you talk to the breeders that have, a, you know, a lot of uh, whelping, it's like one of the biggest things they look for is that drop in temperature in body temperature of the pregnant female, and it gives you about an hour or two. Because I remember talking, having one to come to class, some dog breeder, and she said, the dog, as soon as I get the thermometer, it starts running because it just knows that it's going to get, you know, the body temperature checked. Um, is there anything um, non-invasive uh, to take body temperatures of dogs? Like, you know, when you go to the physician's office, they do the tympanic membrane with that little gun that does infrared. Is there anything equivalent of that to a dog? Yeah, because I think what happens with the, the human, it's more straight to the um, tympanic membrane, so those little things work. But in a dog, it kind of goes like this. And so the tympanic membrane isn't straight in on the ear canal. It's like an L, and you wouldn't get the tympanic membrane if you did that ear uh, gun, whatever you want to call it. Yes? Do it like in the like dogs or sometimes in the ear, or, like 
Is it does it take a little while to to equilibrate? Is it? It's Pretty in instantaneous. Okay. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to hit too is like normally you're thinking mainly just environment on this scenario, but you can also have it like if you had a heating pad under a dog in the winter or something like that, you can just get their temperature too hot because the high heating pads really don't have a shut off point. So then you can have a dog just start cooking from getting mm -hmm. way too hot on there because it can't. And if it can't get them. away from the heating yeah. pad, we'll talk next week about. You know, if you have an animal, let it choose where it's going to lay. That's better than forcing it. Like if there's a heating pad in a dog cage yeah. and it can't. Or like, like after a surgery too, because right. you got them on the cooling heating pad. Right. I think so like we can talk more. about that today. Now, does anybody have any practical things? Yep. Anybody have any practical experience at a vet clinic where a dog came in and it was overheating? Can you tell me what they do? Uh, so we had. It was like a few summers ago. We had a really really hot summer. Um, and just kind of part of the absent-minded way that some people tend to be, because uh, the owner was really distraught. He had forgotten to set out water with his dog, mm -hmm. um, and they were only gone for an hour, but the thing was it was super hot, super humid, and it was a bulldog. Which all yeah, which together, sets up the bad um, scenario. And so um, they brought in the dog. Um, he had dumped it in water before he came, um, which probably isn't the best thing because then you could do shock, but um, the dog was unresponsive. Um, wow, so it came pupils, in and it was unresponsive. His pupils were different sizes, which is also not good <laughs> uh, because then you have brain inflammation. Um, and first we took his temperature, it was way up there, I can't remember what it was off the top of my head, it was hot. Um, and um, we, I can't remember what the medicine was, this was my first week in a clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, and oh, it was a huge bottle of stuff and it got like so we were we're talking about IV, yeah, IV we, we administration. To an IV and we gave it that. I can't remember what it was, mm -hmm. but it was a lot of it. Um, and um, the temperature slowly went down um, over time. Um, the first sign of response that we got was pupil response, and then after like two hours, we had a response correctly. Um, and this was like three hours after we closed too, because it came in right at closing. Right. Um, so after, so the dog became conscious, it was still like my cousin, who is a veterinarian there, uh, was like there's still a high chance that this dog could go. Um, but we ended up sending it to an overnight clinic after it got conscious, like the guy took the IV with him. Um, it was there for the whole weekend. Um, it didn't end up making it, it passed away two oh, days later. Wow. On, Sunday. Just from being an hour, you're saying like they left for an hour and it was so hot. That yeah, 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 was. yeah. And then those, the brachycephalic breeds are already at risk with no problems. Um, anybody else have any experience, like practical experience? Yeah. Um, I worked at the Indiana Grand Racetrack, and sometimes we have thoroughbreds like after races that were overheating, just like on hot days. Yeah. Um, now, so this is interesting. She's going to tell us a story about horses. And you know, horses are one of the few mammals that sweat very well, right? We sweat pretty good, horses, but then you name another mammal that sweats like that. Doesn't. Go ahead. Yeah, so we never like throw them straight under like a cold hose, because like, like I said, with the water, that can just send them straight in the shock and they can literally just like die in the wash rack. Okay. And so we have like super high percent like rubbing alcohol and like hydrogen alcohol. And we literally just had like the big containers of it like in the truck and we would just like um, dump it on the horses because it evaporates a lot faster yep. than water too in general okay, so it right. a lot of heat. Um, so you're evaporating, rubbing bands, alcohol. Um, so we'd have to keep the horse walking because you don't want them to tie up like after you like run a marathon or something you don't just want to like crawl in your right. bed and fall asleep because you're going to be really sore the next day. And so we just use a lot of rubbing alcohol and after they kind of get like under control, like they're breathing and stuff, then we'll start them on like IV fluids, like with the bag and stuff. Okay. Now, do you squeegee off the sweat if they're really sweaty? Um, not if we're rubbing on the alcohol, it just kind of gets rinsed off. It just kind of gets rinsed yeah. off as well. But you dump a lot of alcohol, so it's actually dripping off the animal. Oh yeah, we'll just like have it like, it's like the vet and then like the two tags and we'll just have like the bottles just like over. Just it. all over. Oh yeah, over it's like, not on its like eyes or anything, no, up its no. neck, like yeah. between its legs and stuff. And, and that's what you would do with the thoroughbreds, yeah. Anybody else have practical experience? I know somebody like, about a year ago did the alcohol in the pads, and that seemed to work good for an, a mild case. And horses also have like a 
really large vein, like when they get hot, that bulges out on like the inside of their back legs. Okay. Um, and a lot of times, if you put cool water on that with the hose, then that can cool them down faster than just like soaking their whole body. Right. Because right. like, then that cool like, blood is going to go back into the body and bring heat up to the surface. Excellent practical stuff. Okay, we're ready for the next presenter. Yes, number seven. Is this yours? Yes. Okay, let me enlarge it a little bit. Practice with that. The, the green vertical arrow, or uh, yeah, blind on top there. There you go. Here we go. Okay, so I'll just uh, explain what this is first. This is a graph of the upper critical temperature index for dairy cattle. Uh, so this is basically just, it's based on temperature, humidity, also how much milk the cow is producing, as well as where she's at in her lactation. So basically, um, you have upper critical temperature. It's the danger zone for a cow. So these are the different temperatures where you need to watch out and make sure that you're either cooling them down or like making sure they don't have a fever or anything so they don't get heat struck. And so what we do on produce dairy unit is with their sprinklers set up throughout the entire herd barn and parlor. So when it's hot out, I'd say <coughs> anywhere from 70 or above, we're having the sprinklers on and constantly cooling them off. When I'm in the parlor milking them, I'm spraying them as they leave. It's just a precaution for them so that they don't overheat. I mean, they're producing a lot of heat from all the milk that they're producing. Our cows produce anywhere from 40 to 160 pounds a day. So. We definitely need to stay cooled down. And then if we have extreme cases such as a fever or they're overheating, then we'll bring them into like the box cell unit and hose them down with cool water to try to get their temperature down. So Okay, thank you. I'm gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna of course we're partners, so I wanna make a point. She made a great point. Okay, here's the deal. A lactating dairy cow is a walking furnace, basically. That metabolic rate is so high that Actually, in the winter, she cannot get cold in a still situation. We'll talk about the upper and lower critical temperatures for a dairy cow, but it's amazing. A dairy cow with in still conditions doesn't feel cold until it's 40 below Fahrenheit. You might think that's crazy, but they are a walking furnace. So then on the other end, when it gets warm, that's where problems start. And she said a great little point that I always use, 70 degrees. Anything above 70, it sounds crazy, anything above 70 starts to be too warm for a lactating dairy cow, okay? And then this graph shows you, when it's hot, the two parameters that are big. Temperature, of course, and then the humidity. So when it's hot, humidity has an incredible part to play. When it's cold, humidity is meaningless, okay? So we'll be talking about that, especially next week. So as you get an increase in humidity, the same temperature can go from safe to dangerous or to you know moderately high. But I always say the dairy cow, the lactating dairy cow now, is a walking furnace because she is just so metabolically active and her mammary gland is making a lot of milk and all that stuff is because of her metabolic rate. Thank you. Yeah, for yeah. lower critical temperature, we don't actually have to do much. We just keep the barn doors closed. And yeah. The only thing we really right. do for that is like our calves. We make sure they have a lot of straw. Well, right. Now, calves are different because yeah. they're not lactating dairy cow. But a lactary, and then notice how I said still, because a lot of these temperatures that you read in textbooks, when they call it, we'll talk about the thermal no neutral zone, but it's always with still conditions. Because as soon as you start flowing air, what's that called in the winter time? Wind chill. Then that becomes a different story, okay? But in this still condition, you cannot make a dairy, lactating dairy called cold, no matter what you, if it's still conditions. Thank you, very good. Very practical. A walking furnace. Uh, and number nine can go to the door. Yeah, there's number nine. Okay, this is yours, right? Okay, you want, here, I'll sh give you this pointer. I, this is neat. Here we go. Hold on one second. I'm going to just make, take it away. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the bear hugger, which I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have had experience using. 
Um, it is a warming unit in which uh, heat is transferred to the animal via uh, facilitating movement of warm air across the patient's skin, um, but not on the wound. So if there's any sort of wound, you have to make sure to kind of avoid that. Um, so convection, such as was talked about earlier, forced air warming. Um, so there are three different types of rewarming that I found. There was um, there was inactive external or passive external rewarming, which would be like putting a blanket on, like she was talking about. Um, there is active external rewarming, which is this using a heating pad, um, and then there is um, internal rewarming, such as mm. warm IV fluids, um, and then. So this is used perioperatively, meaning before, during, and after surgery. And I love how she used perioperative. Peri means around, around the time of the operation, before, during, and after, yes. So it, it uses the warming unit, which is this thing right here, and then, um, and then a blanket called a Baja blanket, at least at Purdue's Veterinary <laughs> Hospital. I don't know why it's named a that. Baja? Baja. Is that what you said? B-A-J-A. Baja. B -A -J -A, Baja oh, okay. Blanket. Baja. Uh, <laughs> like the Baja Peninsula, is that what you're saying? Yeah. I um, and then one side it will say the side goes against the patient, and basically there are micro perforations through that in which the air will travel to the patient's oh. skin. Um, so this was manufactured in 1987 and it is currently being manufactured by uh, the company 3M. There are more than 25 blanket varieties. Um, and then the website said there were over 200 million patients that had been helped with this. I'm not sure how you quantify that, um, but over 80% of the U.S. hospitals here um, use it, meaning human hospitals, I'm assuming. So, so this is used in the case of hypothermia, which in humans is defined as below 96.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but in dogs, there's mild, moderate, and severe. So mild hypothermia would be 90 to 99 degrees Fahrenheit which seems kind of severe to me. Yeah, um, yeah, it does. But that's what I found. Mm -hmm. I've never seen a patient after surgery go below 97. So yeah, it's always mild, at least in the oncology department at the hospital. Um, and then severe would be less than 82, which wow. I don't know about that. <laughs> that's, that's really, really bad. You never know. It's, yeah. yeah, and then there's primary and secondary hypothermia. So primary hypothermia would be where the animal has normal heat production, and this is usually environmental, so cold temperatures. And then secondary would be like in this case, or in, in I guess the case that I'm talking about, um, would be abnormal heat production caused by injury, illness, or drugs. So like the anesthetic drugs commonly cause hypothermia, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, so why use this? Mostly in oncology's case, they're just uncomfortable, so it's just cold and um, they're shivering, they're not anywhere near the severe hypothermia stage, um, and so that's just to make them comfortable. Um, and then I have these benefits here that have been demonstrated by multiple studies. Um, so they found that hypothermia can lead to an increased rate of surgical site infection, increased blood loss, and increased mortality rate. So basically you're just trying to help, counteract those. Yes, exactly, help ensure that the patient is healthy post-op. Um, and then there have been over 170 published study articles about um, its efficiency and its safety. And obviously it's commonly used, so it's a very good device to help combat hypothermia. Yeah, I like that a lot. Okay, yes, thank you. And I'm just gonna make a few more points. Whenever you see convective or convection, that's another form of it, that means something's moving. It doesn't have to be air, it can be water. An animal can be in water, and if the water is moving, it can gain or lose heat by convection. And that's what we'll do, especially probably Wednesday and Monday. We'll talk about some of the mechanisms where an animal can gain heat or lose heat, but you know there's other mechanisms that they can only lose heat. It's not possible to gain heat by that mechanism. What was the lower limits again that were mentioned? Uh, the body temperature. I would say let's not remember that. What was the one like uh, nine? For mild, it was 90 to 99, but for severe, it was less than 80. Yeah, I would say anything below 90 would, like, make me very nervous. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, the normal body temperature of, like, a dog is, like, 101.5. Yeah, 97 to a stop is pretty normal. Yeah, so I'm going to say, let's remember 97. Let's not go below 97 post-op. Uh, the other thing I like about these is the micro pores on the inside where it's facing the animal. You're not going to get any 
um, because it's going to be dispersed over all these micro pores, you're not going to get a, a detectable airflow. It's just going to be very mild. And whenever an animal undergoes surgery, usually you worry about hypothermia. You don't really worry about hyperthermia. Does anybody know the case in humans, though, that you do worry about hyperthermia during a surgical procedure? Anybody familiar with that? It's a genetic thing. Now I'm going to tell you the word and you can write it down and we'll talk about it. It's a human condition, it's genetic, it runs in families, and when these people get an, uh, an anesthetic, their body temperature goes crazy up. Malignant hyperthermia, that's exactly what it is. And you've got to be very and they all, whenever you go into these surgery things, they always ask you, do you have any family members or whatever. It runs in, it's a genetic thing. But when those people undergo anesthesia, their muscles start making heat uncontrollably, which sounds crazy, and they're not moving. It's because of the chemical reaction to the anesthetic. Malignant hyperthermia. I'm not sure if it's been demonstrated in any other animal besides humans but it is a, a big problem, okay? Okay, we are doing so well. I cannot believe this, and we didn't even rehearse this. There's that pointer up there. Okay. Um, so this is one of the things that I came up with. I really liked it because I have a big farm where we're at in the summer, and it's basically all open land, and we have these kind of issues. Um, so for summer dangers, just talked about sun and heat, um, fireworks, obviously around the 4th of July, but noises scare my dogs. Parties and barbecues, make sure food's not around, hot cars, and then toxic chemicals. And then I had one more. Oh, um, did you have another one? Yeah, it was just about dehydration. I don't know if you... I don't know if I got it. I don't think I did. Okay, I think we'll that's fine. Well, you heard about dehydration in dogs. You want to just watch for the signs. But the biggest thing for us in the summer is also providing a shady spot for the dogs because we're all open land, we have no trees, and we're outside <laughs> most of the day. So we had to come up with a solution to make sure our dogs had shade while we were outside. So we opened up our shed so they can go into it. And we actually put a kiddie pool outside so when they're running around, they can jump into it and stuff. And then we refill it every day so that it's not too hot for them. Um, and then the last personal experience I wanted to point out was during winter, which you mentioned, is we always have our fireplace going because we're cold. And then I'll notice, especially with my Pomeranian, he starts to kind of go to the front door and like lay at the front door by windows because he's trying to cool off. And so when that happens, I just take him for a walk and normally put him in a different room where there's not the fireplace going because you don't really think about that, but that kind of heat really overwhelms them so mm -hmm. I kind of just watch for signs of him <coughs> panting and one thing I noticed is he keeps going to the windows and I didn't really realize he's trying to cool off from the window so okay just good. that's very good let me make a few other comments here from this presentation yeah I like this whole thing uh, hot cars you know there's some states now that are passing laws that if you rescue a dog like break a window in a car and get a dog out you're not going to be held liable. There are places that will actually charge. I mean, you could. It's like breaking an entry some places, unfortunately. Uh, but there are some states that are like you, you're. You're not going to be. Not sure exactly how the laws are written. Um, so yeah, and they the reach is like 140, 150, maybe not in 10 minutes, but um, in the summer, what I do is in my vehicle just to show people how it can get hot. I should have taken some pictures. I have like a little re recording thermometer that'll tell me the high it reached even if I'm not there. And it's amazing, 130, 140 is very easy. <clears throat> then this barbecue thing, be aware of this because down here where all the fat drips, dogs will come and lick that. And they can die from that. And what do they usually die from when they lick a lot of fat? Pancreatitis. Uh, I've known people, and they'll come up to me and go, you know, if I'm walking a dog, they'll come up and go, can I pet your dog because I just lost mine two months ago and it licked 
grease off the barbecue grill and they didn't realize how it can react and it died, the dog died shortly thereafter of pancreatitis just from licking the fat drippings. And of course there's all these other chemicals that are crazy. So, Okay, excellent. So if you're presenting Wednesday, tomorrow afternoon you'll get an email from me, something straightforward about conduction, convection, Maybe we'll even talk, have somebody talk about malignant hyperthermia a little more. Who knows? Perfect.